Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's actually my pleasure to uh, introduce David for this morning for the keynote. And so David's going to give us uh, the keynote today on biology, a move to dry labs. And so please welcome David to, uh, uh, for this morning. Okay. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me. Uh, the title of my talk is Biology from Wet to Dry. For those of you that know me, you know I've been working in biology for the last, oh, 10 years now. And you may also know that uh, I moved my group from Seattle to Los Angeles a few years back. And that's not what this talk is about. <laughs> <laughs> Rather, it's about an evolution that's going on in the field of biology within the fourth paradigm. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the fourth paradigm. Uh, this is a slide from one of Jim Gray's last talks where he introduces the fourth paradigm. It's about data-intensive science. And what I've noticed uh, over the last two decades is that biology has changed dramatically twice. Uh, the first change I saw was biology going from these creative one-off experiments, usually with small amounts of data, uh, to uh, a situation where there was lots of data. So this would be the move into the fourth paradigm. So in the old days, at least when I was going to school, uh, biology was about somebody falling asleep in front of a fire and seeing a snake come out of the fire and bite its tail and go, oh, I discovered the, I, I figured out what benzene is. You probably all heard that story. <laughs> but um, within the last uh, 20 years or so, we now can easily measure DNA, RNA, proteins, the basic building blocks of biology. We can do so in all sorts of different experimental circumstances, gather lots of data, and it becomes much, much easier to discover things. Um, and as a data analyst, someone who does machine learning statistics, um, uh, it's been very good for us. The data is large. Uh, the scientists occasionally give us these wonderful bits of data, kind of like in the Hunger Games where the guy's throwing out the bread, and we all grab it and say, oh, this is wonderful, and we analyze it, and we give it back to the scientists, and we make, we make good progress. But there's another change that's happening much more recently within the last few years. I've been able to experience it directly, and I've seen lots of others who are experience, experiencing this change as well, and that is because there's so much data out there, you actually don't need collaborators to do the science directly. There's, there's all sorts of data available where you, as a analyst, and of course you have to learn some biology as well, can come in, look at, look at a situation, decide, ah, it would be interesting to test this hypothesis, and the data is already there available to you to do that testing. So you can, without any collaboration with a wet lab at all, you can write scientific papers. So what I'd like to do today is give you a couple of examples in this category, and you'll see how within those examples we're kind of transitioning into this category. And then I'll give you a few examples where we, we've done some work directly uh, without any collaboration and have been able to publish uh, some real science. Uh, the work that you're going to hear about um, involves these folks. These are the uh, researchers in the eScience Research Group. Great gang. Okay, so let's start with um, the genomics revolution. We'll talk about a project in this space. I'm sure you all know there is a genomics revolution going on now, and what's driving that revolution is the cost of sequencing DNA is decreasing, and it's decreasing even more rapidly than Moore's law. So this graph here is a plot of how much it costs to single a single human genome as a function of time. Uh, this white line here represents Moore's Law, scaled, um, and you can see the costs are just dropping dramatically. 
Uh, over, a little over a decade ago, it cost $100 million to sequence the first human genome. And any day now, we're going to hear from uh, the uh, XPRIZE folks that someone is going to sequence a uh, human genome for $1,000 per person. And besides the human genome, you can measure a million genetic markers now for well under $100 a person. So with that decrease in cost comes a wealth of data. And one of the things you can do with that data is personalized medicine. You can identify genetic markers that correlate with things that are of clinical interest, such as are you likely to get a disease? Will you react badly to a drug? Will you react favorably to a drug? And then for each individual, you, once you know, you don't have to know their whole genome, you just know, say, a million genetic markers from them for this cost of $100, and you're able to uh, personalize the treatment that you give these individuals. Now, one common way for finding these associations between genetic markers and traits of interest is called GWAS, which stands for Genome-Wide Association Studies. Uh, what you do, it's very simple. You, you think of something that's interesting to you, some trait of interest, um, uh, coronary, artery, coronary artery disease status, uh, age of death, um, does this drug work or not? And you get a bunch of people for which, let's say, the drug works, and a bunch of people for which the drug doesn't work, maybe a thousand people each. You sequence their genome or get m measure a million genetic markers, sometimes called SNPs, for single nucleotide polymorphisms. You measure these SNPs, and then you just look for differences across the, these million markers between the people in one group and the people in the other group. It's very straightforward. It's, this has been done now for almost uh, you know, five, five to ten years. And what you see here is, uh, are, are some of the results from that. Each one of these bars is one of your chromosomes, chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome 3. And each of these colored dots corresponds to some study that's found a correlation between this region of the chromosome and some trait of interest. Uh, you can see there's a lot of them. This is actually a uh, uh, an old slide now. These findings are growing exponentially. And if you listen to the radio while you're driving around, you probably ever, at least once a week you hear the result of a new study where they found some association between uh, your genetics and some interesting trait. Uh, here's an example of uh, GWAS in action. We did this with uh, Brian Trainer at the NIH. Uh, he had a cohort of individuals from Finland, about 500 of whom had Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS, and the other 500 were normal. We did the GWAS. We found a few genetic markers that were highly associated with uh, the differences in these two groups. And uh, after a bit, after rather a lot of work on Brian's part, uh, the SNPs are, are spaced across the genome. So once you find an associated SNP, you have to actually have to then look for the actual causal region of the DNA, which is usually near the SNP, uh, that does does the um, that that's actually directly responsible for the disease, but he did that in the lab, and he was able to find this uh, DNA change, and it turned out to be a single DNA change uh, that accounted for uh, this cohort. And in fact, when he looked further, it accounted for a third of all uh, inherited uh, Lou Gehrig's disease in Europe. So this was, this was a uh, very large finding uh, published in Neuron last year. But the point is, it's, it's straightforward to do. And you do, in our case, you needed a collaborator. He had to collect the individuals uh, to do the, the study, and then he had to go back into the lab to isolate the, uh, the actual cause of the, um, of the disease. OK, so there are several issues with GWAS. One is that this has been going on now for a while, and so a lot of the hanging fruit has been picked. Uh, much of the remaining signal is weak and scattered across the genome. And so to pick up these remaining signals, uh, we need lots of data. And people have recognized this, and various groups are collecting large amounts of data. Uh, DECODE, uh, the team that basically has sequenced everyone in Iceland. Uh, 23andMe, you may have heard about, Kaiser Permanente. Uh, they all now have genomes for over 100,000 people and are doing this uh, GWAS work. But there's an issue when you collect lots of data for lots of people. 
you get what's called confounding. So you get your data, you run your simple statistical analyses looking for these differences between groups, and you find a, a significant difference, but it turns out that that, di uh, that uh, association is false. It's not a, it has nothing to do with a causal effect of the SNPs on the uh, trait. And the reason is because uh, the, this data gets complicated when it gets large. You usually have multiple ethnicities, you have closely related individuals in that data, and that causes this confounding. And let me give you an example of that. So let's consider just one genetic marker. One SNP, it has two values, A or T. Remember, it's ACTG. Usually at any given SNP, you only see two. So let's say we have A and T, and each circle here represents a person and the, uh, the genetic marker that they have. So this column here are the cases. These are the people that have the disease. And these are the controls. These are the people that don't have the disease. And if you look naively, you say, ah, oh, there's more A's in the cases and there's more T's in the controls. So I found an association. But it turns out this association is false uh, due to confounding. And what's really going on is that there's actually two populations of people that you've measured, uh, population one shown here, population two shown here. Maybe it's different ethnicities. Uh, so in population one, there's more A's than T's. And in population two, there's more T's than A's. And then finally, it just happens by the way you gathered your data that uh, there's more of population one in cases and more of population two in the controls. These things taken together makes it look like there's an association between having the SNP and having the disease, but it's a false one. Okay, so we want to get rid of this problem, and there are actually statistical algorithms out there to do that. Uh, the animal breeders, um, people have been looking at genetics of animals for a long, long time, 100 years. Uh, the human stuff is very recent. Uh, but the animal breeders, because of this, they have their act together. They've, they developed beautiful statistical algorithms for uh, handling this problem, and they're called linear mixed models. Um, they work great, but there's one catch. Uh, they're very computationally expensive. So if you analyze n individuals with a linear mixed model, it will cost you o n cubed runtime and o n squared memory use to do so. So if you get data sets with over 5,000 people in it, the memory use alone is going to start to kill you, and you're going to have to wait a long, long time to get an answer. But what we did at Microsoft in my group is basically with algebra, uh, we figured out how to reduce this uh, runtime and memory use to linear. And to do so, it was a lot of algebra, and there's one statistical trick that we used. And it turned out that this statistical trick not only made the analysis faster, but it made it more accurate. So we were actually able to see more signal by doing this trick than, than not. So this is one of those very <laughs> rare circumstances in computer science where you do something to make an algorithm faster or use less memory, and you improve that algorithm at the same time. So we got very lucky here. Uh, we published these results in Nature uh, in two different articles, and it's being used quite a bit right now. Okay, uh, let, me, let me stop there. Any questions? I'm going to move on to another project. Okay? <laughs> uh, maybe you'll think of something as we go. Okay, this is another project I've been working on for almost 10 years, having to do with uh, the design of vaccines for HIV. And uh, before I, I was working in biology at Microsoft, I was working on uh, various machine learning projects. And one thing I did was uh, 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 build a spam filter. This was way back in 1997. Uh, I guess I have a very low tolerance for junk mail because after I received my 10th or so junk mail, I said, this is it, I've had it. Uh, I do not want to ever see one of these things again. And I told my team, start gathering your, your junk mail and your regular mail. We're going to build a machine learning filter to distinguish the two. We did, and eventually that machine learning filter got shipped in all sorts of different uh, products at Microsoft, Outlook, Hotmail, Exchange, and so forth. Uh, and once we started deploying this thing uh, uh, in the real world, 
the spammers took notice, as you might know already, and they started changing their messages to get around our filters. So we would uh, catch the word Viagra, and they'd say, oh, we'll just put in, we'll change one of the A's to an at sign, and we'll fool this uh, spam filter. It'll miss the word, and so it won't be able to detect this message as being spam. And we said, ah, they've changed their A to an at sign. Okay, well, we'll recognize that. And then the spammers would say, oh, they've, they've figured that one out. Let's put a bitmap in that says Viagra. So they'll never see that. And then we said, ah, okay, we'll put in a... Um, We'll put in a, a, a recognition system that looks at bitmaps and actually tries to read them. And this goes back. This went back and forth and back and forth over a couple of years. And at, at some point, we said, you know, this has got to stop. Uh, what can we do? And we said, well, let's go after the weak link of these spammers. And, and one of the, at least one of their weak links is they have to get money from you somehow. So we started cataloging the links in email messages that take you away to some spot to get your credit card number or something like that. And that worked very well. So we had this catalog of, of uh, junk mail links, uh, or links that take you to sites uh, to extract money from you. And so if a message had one of those links in it, we'd think it's very likely to be junk mail, and we would flag it. That worked great. So going after the weak link of the spammers uh, turned out to be a good solution. OK, so now fast forward uh, five or 10 years. I'm looking at HIV. And situation is actually pretty similar. HIV is a virus, and it's a, it's a rather odd virus because it mutates so rapidly. If you look at how much HIV mutates when it gets into a single individual, so usually it, it, it'll come into an individual in exactly one form, one strain, and then you look a couple years later, you see as much evolution taking place as you do if you looked at the entire evolution of influenza in known history. So that's how bad HIV is. It really, really mutates. Um, so what do we do? So uh, we tried several things, um, but then there's this connection with the spam filtering, um, which is HIV, uh, your immune system starts to attack HIV. HIV mutates to avoid that attack, then your immune system reattacks and you go back and forth. Very similar situation as in the spam filtering case. So we thought, huh, is there a weak link of HIV? And uh, for the last, oh, five years or so now, we've been, we've been uh, doing some research based on this hypothesis that there are weak links in HIV, and I think we now have evidence that there are, so let me go through that. Uh, this is a schematic of HIV. HIV is about 9,000 nucleotides long. It codes for a series of proteins, as I've shown here, gag, pole, VIF, envelope, and so forth. And our working hypothesis is that among these 9,000 nucleotides, there's small regions, which I've denoted here in red. There might be more of them. Hopefully, there are more of them. Small regions, tiny regions, where if HIV is forced to mutate in these regions, due to an attack by your immune system, HIV will become weak or ideally dead. Um, and then the vast majority of regions in HIV we think are fine. Your immune system attacks there, nothing happens. It mutates. HIV mutates to avoid the attack, and it's fine. And that's what's shown here. Uh, what we think is going on is, is left to its own devices. Our immune system attacks at random spots along HIV, missing these vulnerable spots. And so HIV, unfortunately, lives, lives on happily inside your system. OK, so what we want to do then is obviously identify these weak points and then design a vaccine that teaches your immune system to attack at precisely those weak points. OK, so now you get the vaccine. This is before you have HIV. You get the vaccine. Your immune system already knows where the weak spots are. And then if you're unfortunate enough to get infected with HIV, your immune system directs the attack precisely where it should be at these vulnerable spots on HIV, either weakening or killing the virus. So that's, that's the working hypothesis. We've been now studying this for, um, as I said, about five years with Bruce Walker at Harvard. Uh, using various experiments, uh, we have identified uh, maybe a half dozen weak spots which is very encouraging, but it's not enough. The reason it's not enough is because 
we all have different immune systems. Uh, just like we have different blood types, you know, type A, type B, type O, we have different immune system types. In fact, there's a lot of different types, hundreds of different types across um, the human race. And different types of immune systems can attack, are only able to attack at different spots along HIV. So even though, let's say, this is a vulnerable point here, if you have a particular immune system, you, not, you might not be able to attack there. So what we want to do is catalog enough vulnerable points such that each immune system type, or at least most immune system types, are capable of attacking at least one of these vulnerable spots. And then we'll give a cocktail uh, vaccine that teaches different immune systems different places to attack along HIV. So uh, we're continuing to do this work, but one line of work is instead of looking at single points of attack, let's look at double points of attack. And to illustrate that, I want to switch to a demo here. This is a tool that we've built uh, uh, that's helped our researchers, our collaborators, uh, find two points of attack. Let's see. OK. Right there. See, this is uh, kind of bluish, and this is uh, rather pinkish. Um, these are, this is a molecule of HIV uh, folded in its uh, functional form. And uh, you see here two points along HIV. They're not near each other in linear space, but they're near each other in physical space. Uh, and these two points come very close to each other, and they probably influence one another. That is, if this site were to mutate, uh, then this site probably needs to mutate as well to maintain the function of this molecule. All right, and so this is a possible two-point attack on HIV. What we can do is make a vaccine that tells the immune system to attack at the pink spot, forcing HIV to mutate here, but also telling the immune system to attack the amino acid that this amino acid would become if it were forced to mutate because this one mutates. Okay, So uh, we, we want to put the virus between a rock and a hard place. We want to force it to either mutate here, in which case it'll die, or, uh, well, mutate here and not mutate here. That's, that's the basic idea. So if we force it to mutate here and not mutate here, then it, has, it can either not mutate at all in which case it'll die, or it can mutate and therefore uh, hurt the function of the protein because this one won't be able to mutate. This one mutates, messes up the function of the, uh, the protein. So to do that, we're using a, a completely a wet uh, dry lab approach. This is now kind of the move into the dry lab where we're taking publicly available data, uh, which basically is uh, data from individuals uh, about their sequences that they have in them and what their immune system type is. And uh, we're able to look for these uh, places in HIV where when one amino acid mutates, another one mutates as well. Uh, this program is called Phylo-D. This is meant to be a linear representation of the gag protein, now stretched out, not folded anymore. And all these lines here show places of covariation. So when the uh, amino acid here mutates, the amino acid over here mutates, the amino acid over here mutates, and so forth. So this gives us a, a, um, a look into the virus and its constraints, what it, how, it, how, it, um, how these pairs of amino acids evolve and therefore um, potential two-point uh, uh, positions for, for attack. OK. So again, uh, that, that's very, so we've moved from the wet lab, collaborating with Bruce Walker now into the dry lab, uh, looking for these two-point uh, positions of attack just with data that's, that's available. Okay. Um, any questions about that? I'm going to move to some real, real dry lab projects now. All right. So one thing that's happening in biology uh, is that not only is data a commodity now, we know the basic building blocks, RNA, DNA, protein, we can measure those uh, very easily, but it's so commonplace now that there are uh, sites that are, or, or commercial companies that are starting that let you just order these experiments online. So you can go online and say, I want this strain of mouse 
give, give half of them this drug, give half of them this other drug, measure their gene expression, and mail back the data to me. And you never have to touch a, uh, a wet lab. Uh, so there's, it's, it's data for order. But as I was saying at the beginning of the talk, there's already a lot of data out there. This is part of the fourth paradigm. And so let me show you some examples of what you can do with data that's already out there. Uh, basic science. OK, so um, I think you've all had at least one biology class. And in that biology class, you were inevitably told about the two theories of evolution, Lamarck's theory and Darwin's theory. And um, you know, Darwin had this idea there's something in you that gets passed down and causes your traits. And Lamarck had this absolutely crazy theory that said things that happened to you during your life would influence something inside of you that got passed down and, uh, and then change your traits. And, and the, the canonical example was the uh, giraffe who, whose neck grows ever longer because it's trying to reach for those higher bits of food. And then the longer neck somehow gets passed down into its generations. Uh, and the neck just keeps getting longer and longer. And I remember my biology teacher just laughing, you know, sa saying, oh, isn't this a silly theory? You know, Darwin's theory is obviously correct. And now, a few years ago, we realized that both these theories are correct. Uh, there's the genome, which is what Darwin was talking about. And there's the epigenome, which is what Lamarck is talking about. And the idea here is that things that happen to you during your lifetime, usually traumatic events, change this thing called the epigenome, which then gets passed down to your offspring, just like your DNA. Um, and so th this epigenome now is uh, becoming better and better characterized. But one thing we were interested in was, is there a relationship between the genome and the epigenome? Your genome influences what you look like. Uh, how fat you are, you know, how long you're going to live, and so forth. Maybe it influences what happens to your epigenome. And there's, there was data out there that allowed us to look at this question. It was online. It's in dbGaP, a system you can, go, you can go in and with a little bit of, you have to wait a couple weeks or months to get permission to use it. But once you have that permission, you get the data and uh, you analyze it. And we analyzed that data. This is a project with Jennifer Liskarten and others at, uh, in my group. And sure enough, we found very distinct interactions between the genome and epigenome. And this paper is, um, has been accepted for publication. No, no outside collaboration. OK, here's, here's one of my favorite examples. This is from the, the Butte Lab uh, at Stanford, published in Science uh, last year. Um, there's this thing called drug repurposing. So uh, the idea is uh, a drug company will develop a drug for a, s a specific purpose. And uh, it'll cost lots and lots of money to get it through the FDA, safety approvals, uh, or safety trials, efficacy trials. And eventually it gets used. But then occasionally it's discovered, usually by happenstance, that the drug is useful for something else. Uh, minoxidil is a good example. It's a, it was a drug designed for lowering your blood pressure. And people who were receiving this drug got unwanted hair all over the place. And some clever person said, wait a minute, uh, hair is not necessarily unwanted. And figured out that if you pour this stuff on your head, you can grow hair back on your head, so on the top of your head. So it became a very good drug for that purpose. I think it's probably used a lot more for that purpose than it was for its original purpose now. So this is drug repurposing. And these folks at Stanford thought, huh, I wonder if we could use available data to more deliberately repurpose drugs than just wait around for some interesting uh, uh, coincidence to be observed. So they did something very simple. There's data out there relating disease and gene expression. So you have maybe 20,000 different genes. And there's data there saying if there's differences in how this particular gene is expressed, whether you have a disease or not. So this, this matrix or this array here is meant to represent these differences um, between whether there's an expression or not for each gene. So that each one of these squares represents a gene. And let's say uh, green represents no difference, and red represents a lot of difference, and white is neutral. OK, so you have that data publicly available. There's also uh, similar data that's publicly available relating drugs to gene expression. So uh, 
you, um, th this box means uh, this particular, a particular gene is expressed very differently if you take the drug versus if you don't take the drug. And so you have a profile like that across all 20,000 genes. And so these folks at Stanford hypothesized, well, if you have two profiles that are anti-correlated, if you have a disease profile and a drug profile that are anti-correlated, maybe taking that drug will help with the disease. So, right? so if a gene goes up when you take a drug and it goes down when you have a disease, maybe there's something there to it, especially if you look across all genes. So they did that and they found some correlations. They found one very strong correlation, which is um, between um, uh, a drug used for treating ulcers called cimetidine and the disease uh, adenocarcinoma of the lung. And sure enough, they tried it out, it works. So, again, no, except for the final trial, obviously you have to go back and try it, but uh, they found this drug with just data off the shelf. Okay, and finally one last project, going back uh, to the uh, GWAS work that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Uh, this is uh, what we call the Moondog Project at Microsoft. Um, there is data publicly available again uh, from the Wellcome Trust, in England on data for seven common diseases. So for uh, individuals with these uh, seven diseases and for a set of controls, they measured about a half a million uh, SNPs. The diseases include, they're very common, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, uh, hypertension, and so on. Uh, so people have analyzed this data a lot, but we had FastLim available to us now, which allows us to analyze this very large data set very quickly. And we have Azure, which is a system that allows you to do parallel computation uh, very easily. This is actually commercially available. Anybody can use it. Um, and so we thought, well, let's, let's go for the next uh, big problem, which is to look at not how single SNPs interact with these traits, which are whether you get these diseases or not, but how pairs of SNPs interact with these traits. So we want to look at interactions either between SNPs within the same gene or SNPs in different genes, all of them. Uh, there's 60 billion pairs to look at, so without FastLim and without Azure, we wouldn't have been able to do this. But we had it, so we did it. It was 400 compute years worth of work. We did it in less than a day, thanks to Azure. And sure enough, we found uh, some very interesting uh, interactions in these SNPs for coronary, uh, for one of the diseases, namely coronary artery disease, and this paper is now in submission as well. Okay, so I uh, just wanted to take you through this tour of what's happening in biology. It seems it's not just me and my group, there's lots of uh, groups uh, throughout the country now that are producing uh, very, very uh, legitimate uh, biology work uh, without the need for collaboration. And again, uh, this is, I think, one of the, the natural steps that we're going to see within the uh, fourth paradigm. With that, I'll take questions. Questions? It's a very interesting talk. Um, I just have a question regarding how you validate the uh, dry lab experiments back to the wet lab or the real problems. Uh, yes. After you did the e-science design, how could you verify yep. that? Or are you totally driving out the wet lab? Thank you. Well, uh, ultimately, you'll have a wet lab when you want to deploy it. You know, if, you're, if you discover a drug in the repurposing case, you discover these associations which will lead possibly to the discovery of drug, you have to bring the, the uh, clinical side, at least the clinical side back in, uh, which could involve a wet lab. But uh, validation is a very good point. Uh, there's so much data out there and analysis of that data that's been done. When you find a new association, you can check the literature or these data sets and see whether the, with, with a different analysis and with a different cohort of people, you find the same 
association. So you can either look in the literature, it might already be there, unvalidated, and now you have a validation for it, or you can go into another data set because there, are, there are, is so much data out there on a different set of people, do the same experiment again and see if it checks. Yes? So have you noticed uh, in these databases processing power being available as well? You were able to use Azure, or, but are people starting to make publicly available compute resources as well? Uh, for free? I guess either for free or for a cost, you know, a, a reasonable cost. Sure, the, uh, you can go on Azure now and, and get out your credit card and you have those computational resources available to you. Some of the, uh, the methylation experiment, for example, was done on a single machine. So it depends on what question you're asking. Um, we deliberately, uh, that, that last slide I showed you with the Moondog project, we deliberately went after something that was computationally difficult just to to show the world now where, where we are and, and, and that we can actually take the next step. But there's a lot of questions you can answer on a single machine with good uh, algorithms. Yeah, I was wondering though if, if places that are making the data available are also starting to make compute available. Oh, the same places, right. uh, well, the, the people are making data available are people like uh, uh, the dbGaP and the European um, corresponding organization whose name slips my mind right now, but they are not making the computation available. But it's, you can download it and then, uh, you can download the data and then move it to uh, some site where, you, where the computation is available. Yeah, it That's seems not like convenient, it's much better to move the computation to right. the data in these cases. Yeah. And uh, uh, no one's figured that, no one's figured, people have figured that out, but they haven't figured out how to make it work yet. Yeah. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, how those algorithms you present today or other bio, bioinformatics algorithms in general, computationally intensive. Um, so my question is, I guess my question is, um, so compared with the HPC computing environment or cloud computing, so those algorithms are enough to learn in cloud environments, or if you, if you use HPC machines, then can you get more faster results, something like that? So uh, is your question, are the algorithms fast enough that you don't need a cloud? Fast enough to use the clouds, or can you do more faster, get the faster result if you use HPC? HPC. Mm -hmm. uh, the big issue there is the size of the data. So if, you're, if your data is huge, getting it to the cloud is the, is the bottleneck. And there are plenty of examples on both sides. There's, uh, there's a cancer genomics data set that um, they're putting together at UCSC, 10 petabytes. You're not going to move that to the cloud. You've got to move your computation to, to that data. But there's plenty of other, there's smallish data sets on dbGaP where, for example, the, with the, methylation, with the um, epigenetic uh, question that we looked at, was simple enough to download and run on a single machine. So th there's both extremes nice. happening. Great, thank you. Yeah. So do you see um, the major data centers making an effort to start putting data, large data sets on the cloud. Yes. I know um, there was the Thousand Genome Project did, but a it's actually a remarkably small number that actually keep the up-to-date data sets in the cloud for these very reasons. Yes, I know there's a desire to do that, and um, that the, the reality has not caught up with that desire yet. But the, there's a lot of people thinking about that, and I expect uh, so long as uh, the, the payoffs from these genetic analyses that are very large right now, as, if they continue, uh, I think we'll see it happening. Maybe just along those lines, is the, is the bottleneck tend to be the data providers or the cloud providers? Because one of the tricks with the 1,000 Genomes Project was that Amazon hosted it for free. Um, I think one of the major bottlenecks will be security and privacy. I think that's the biggest bottleneck. Uh, because uh, uh, the Thousand Genomes Project is completely open. That's, that's an exception. 
Sorry, just most of the data sets uh, you mentioned, were they, you mentioned publicly available, were they still encumbered with privacy concerns? Or were Absolutely. They, I see, so everything you talked about was not something I can just go download myself. And I grab. think a thousand genomes is the one exception, and, and a hat map you can just go and download. But most of the data, it's genetic data, it's identify, you can identify a human being with that data. And so um, there, there's, I, I would say, Le well less than half the data you can download without IRB approval, and most of the data you need IRB approval to, to download, which takes months if, if you've ever and, gone and through the procedure. And just one final question. So most of the projects you talked about, you went through a process of getting IRB approval for the publicly available data sets before you were able to do the work? Uh, let's see. The ones I talked about, the Welcome Trust data, you do not need IRB, but it took two months to get the data because they check you out first and make sure you're legitimate. Uh, the dbGaP data is the same. It took about two months. Um, yeah, so we, uh, these projects sort of ran, it's just a random coincidence that, that these two happen not to involve IRB approval, but we do have IRB approval and we're doing many more projects with much more data available after you get IRB approval. Uh, so the, the last part of your talk was concerned with um, finding new, new drugs or new applications for drugs. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could use the methods there uh, in reverse and if you could use this kind of scanning to eliminate medications that are not effective as, um, you know, as, as, as they're sold or um, to counter, um, you know, the reports you sometimes read that pharmaceutical companies are inventing diseases rather than drugs to keep reselling uh, rebranding drugs that they have, especially yeah. mental disorders, or yeah. um, could, could you launch a counterattack using your methods? You could certainly do that scan and see uh, and check that. I think usually the case is if a drug has been approved by the FDA for a given purpose, it probably helps at least some people for that purpose. Uh, it would be tough for something otherwise to happen. However, what we're seeing in the pharmacogenetic space is that a drug that works for one person does not necessarily work for another person. And so looking for correlations between your genome and whether a drug works for you is a very uh, useful endeavor. And there's lots and lots of people doing that. And I expect very soon to see uh, uh, a situation where you go into your pharmacy and you probably know right now, if you hand a pharmacist a prescription, they will check that prescription against any other pres prescriptions they've, they've given you for drug-drug interactions. I suspect we'll very soon see the same thing happening with drug genome interactions. And if there is an interaction, they'll get on the phone with your doc and say, you know, this drug is either going to really harm this patient or it's not going to work for them. Let's think of something else we can give them. Um, is your data skewed by essentially people publishing just the positive data, not the negative stuff? So essentially, what you said about it is essentially able to do experiments in the dry lab, but essentially you can't do those experiments, or you can't do them properly without validating every single one of them in the wet yeah. lab as well, so you don't really remove the, the actual need to do the experiment properly? There, there's so much, there's a lot of data out there that fits the description you describe. But fortunately, there's a lot of meta-information, usually a paper or two, describing uh, the work around the generation of that data. And you can see whether there's going to be biases in the way the data is collected. Uh, I would say uh, the majority, for example, on dbGaP, there's a lot of GWAS data there. And because it's GWAS data, it was deliberately collected to have not only uh, cases but controls, uh, people that don't have the disease kind of randomly selected. And uh, again, there's articles describing the collection of that work. And you can read those articles, and there's details about how that data was collected. And you can decide whether that data is appropriate for a particular analysis that you want to do. So it's actually a fairly, there's, we're in a fairly good situation. Yes, there's biased data there, but it's labeled as such, and you can, and you can know to avoid it. So, um, following on, so I, I used to work for one of the resources where I guess you're getting some of your data from for the gene expression. Um, stuff. And essentially the, the problem with that resource is that essentially it's splitting up the um, factor values. Um, so it's not, so if you do a certain experiment for instance with uh, a drug, it's a drug at a particular compound and a particular individual 
um, over a certain time point. So it's, it's, it's a compound factor, it's not just one. So how does your resource deal with pulling out that data or um, sorting out that data after, well essentially the data that's coming out back to you yeah. is essentially not correct because it's giving you a p-value, for instance, um, which is based on the actual data store itself. So everything is renormalized on that particular data set. Do you do extra validation on that? Yeah, well, uh, one thing you can do, uh, I can't tell you the answer for the, uh, the uh, drug repurposing study in particular, because that's not my work. That was done by Atul Butte at Stanford. So I'm not sure exactly what he did to uh, adjust for those issues. He may have done nothing, and he simply looked for, uh, he lived with the confounding and found a result that happened to work, perhaps not justifiably so through the statistics. But uh, he's, he's a good statistician, so I suspect that he did whatever he could, given the data he had, to avoid those things. Uh, it, for example, there might be batch effects, and if in this data, he, he may have thrown out any data that didn't have the batch labelings on them, and then using statistical methods to adjust for those batch effects. But again, I can't tell you what he did exactly, because it, it it's his study. Any other? John. And, and David, so one of the things you're, you're is kind of coming out of those answers is that you still have to do your due diligence on the data sets and the uh, information Absolutely. that you're using. It's not just going out and pulling down willy-nilly data no. sets and using them. That's correct. So my, my question is just about um, what, what might happen in the future. So if you imagine 10 years down the, down the track, what, what would that look like, you know, and what do we need to, what are the key things we need to do to get there to make us uh, more efficient and productive? Well, there's so many things we can do. Um, right now, I feel like uh, um, Alan Turing being asked right after he developed his theory uh, to predict Twitter and Facebook. I, there's, a, there's a lot of, when you have this exponential growth or decrease in the cost of uh, DNA, it's kind of hard to predict all the wonderful things that are going to happen. Some things that will definitely happen uh, are personalized medicine. So let, let me focus on that one. Uh, personalized medicine has already begun in many locations. At UCLA, right now, if you walk into, a, uh, into the hospital with some condition, if the doctor thinks that there might be some insights from your genome to help diagnose or treat that condition, he can write a prescription, if you will, for a genetic test that gets done on the spot and within 24 hours he's got the results back to uh, uh, help guide uh, diagnosis and treatment for you. I think that's going to be, that, in 10 years, that's going to be commonplace. Uh, how do we get there more quickly? Uh, we're going to need uh, continual improvement in um, computation and uh, algorithm, al algorithm design. And we're going to need a lot of thinking about the ethics and privacy around this data. That's probably, I, I think that's going to be the biggest bottleneck to getting to the place that I just described. Any other questions? Well, let's uh, thank David again for his talk. <laughs>